Dialectical Materialism and the Fate of Humanity by C.L.R. James Mankind has obviously reached the end of something. The crisis is absolute. Bourgeois civilization is falling apart and even while it collapses, devotes its main energies to the preparation of further holocausts. Not remote states on the periphery, but regimes contending for world power achieve the most advanced st stages of barbarism known to history. What civilized states have ever approached Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia in official lies, official murder, and the systematic brutalization and corruption of their population? Only a shallow empiricism can fail to see that such monstrous societies are not the product of a national peculiarity, the German character, or system of government, communism, but are part and parcel of our civilization. Everything that has appeared in these monstrous societies is endemic in every contemporary nation. Millions in the United States know that Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia will have nothing to teach the American bourgeoisie when it finds itself threatened by the revolutionary American workers seeking the complete expression of democracy, which is socialism. The dream of progress has become the fear of progress. Men shrink with terror at the hint of scientific discoveries. If it were known tomorrow that the crown of human technical achievement, the processes of manufacturing atomic energy, had been lost beyond recovery, this scientific disaster would be hailed as the greatest good fortune of decades. But the seal of the bankruptcy of bourgeois civilization is the bankruptcy of its thought. Its intellectuals run to and fro, squealing like hens in a barnyard when a plane passes overhead. Not a single philosopher or publicist has any light to throw on a crisis in which the fate not of a civilization, but of civilization itself is involved. The Keynesian theories are now part of the, part of the history of economics. The ridiculous four freedoms of the late President Roosevelt take their place with the three principles of Sun Yat-sen, the father-in-law of Chiang Kai-shek, the thousand years of Hitler's Reich and the socialism in a single country of Stalin. The tattering of Sidney Hook and Harold Lasky is stunned into silence by the immensity of their own inadequacies. Thought has abdicated. The world is rudderless. All illusions have been destroyed. Man is at last compelled to face with sober sense his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. And in face of this, the bourgeoisie has nothing to say. The method of thinking is rooted in society. Bourgeois thought has collapsed because bourgeois society has collapsed. We have learnt by hard necessity the truth of the following dictum of Trotsky. Hegel and his logic established a series of laws, change of quantity into quality, development through contradictions, conflict of content and form, interruption of continuity, change of possibility into inevitability, etc., which are just as important for theoretical thought as the simple syllogism for more elementary tasks. Um, that's Trotsky from In Defense of Marxism. Hegel defines the principles of contradiction as follows. Contradiction is the root of all movement in life, and it is only insofar as it contains a contradiction that anything moves and has impulse and activity. The first thing to note is that Hegel makes little attempt to prove this. A few lines later, he says, with regard to the assertion that contradiction does not exist, that it is non-existent, we may disregard this statement. We here meet one of the most important principles of the dialectical logic, and one that has been consistently misunderstood, vilified, or lied about. Dialectic for Hegel was a strictly scientific method. He might speak of inevitable laws, but he insists from the beginning that the proof of dialectic as, as scientific method is that the laws prove their correspondence with reality. Marx's dialectic is of the same character. Thus, he excluded what later became the critique of political economy from capital, because it took for granted what only the detailed argument and logical development of capital could prove. Still more specifically, in his famous letter to Kugelman on the theory of value, he ridiculed the idea of having to prove the labor theory of value. If the labor theory of value proved to be the means whereby the real, real relations of bourgeois society could be demonstrated in their movement, 
where they came from, what they were, and where they were going. That was the proof, proof of the theory. Neither Hegel nor Marx understood any other scientific proof. To ask for some proof of the laws, as Burnham implied, or to prove them wrong, as Sidney Hook tried to do, this is to misconceive dialectical logic entirely. Hegel complicated the question by his search for a completely closed system embracing all aspects of the universe. This no Marxist ever did. The frantic shrieks that Marx's dialectic is some sort of religion or teleological construction, proving inev inevitably the victory of socialism, spring usually from men who are frantically defending the inevitability of bourgeois democracy against the proletarian re revolution. So convinced a Marxist, as Trotsky reminded the revolutionaries in 1939, that Marxists were not fatalists. If, said he, the international proletariat, as a result of the experience of our entire epoch and the current new war, proves incapable of becoming the master of society, this would signify the foundering of all hope for a socialist revolution, for it is impossible to expect any other more favorable condition for it. The Marxian expectation of socialism, arising from the contradictions of capitalism, would have proved itself to be utopia. The law of contradiction is what for the moment we can call a hypothesis for the grouping of empirical facts. All men use hypotheses for the grouping of facts. That is what logic consists of. The bourgeois hypotheses are for the most part unconscious. They are the inevitability of bourgeois society, natural division of labor, more particularly of men into capitalists and workers, constantly expanding technical progress, constantly expanding production, constantly expanding democracy, constantly rising culture. But during the last 30 years, these have crumbled to dust in their hands. They have no hypotheses they can believe in, and that is why they cannot think. Historical facts, large and small, continuously deliver shattering blows at the foundation of their logical system. Nothing remains for, for them but the logic of the machine gun and the crude empiricism of police violence. Quite different is the mode of thought of Marxism. It understands its own logical laws. For Marxists, the fundamental logical law is the contradictory nature of all phenomena and, first of all, human society. The dialectic reaches that, in all forms of society we have known, the increasing development of material wealth brings with it the increasing degradation of the large mass of humanity. Capitalism, being the greatest wealth-producing system so far known, has carried its contradictions to a pitch never known before. Thus it is that the moment when the world system of capitalism has demonstrated the greatest productive powers in history is exactly the period when barbarism threatens to engulf the whole of society. The anti-dialecticians stand absolutely dumbfounded before the spectacle of the mastery of nature for human advancement and the degradation of human nature by this very mastery. The greater the means of transport, the less men are allowed to travel. The greater the means of communication, the less men freely interchange ideas. The greater the possibilities of living, the more men live in terror of mass annihilation. The bourgeoisie cannot admit this, for to admit it is themselves it to admit it is themselves to sanction the end of the bourgeois civilization. Hence the complete paralysis of bourgeois thought. It never was thought of a fundamental character so necessary to mankind, as our political tendency has recently written. It is precisely the character of our age and the maturity of humanity that obliterates the opposition between theory and practice, between the intellectual preoccupations of the educated and of the masses. All the great philosophical concepts from the nature of the philosophical universe, atomic energy, through the structure and function of productive systems, free enterprise, socialism, or communism, the nature of government, the state versus the individual, to the destiny of man, can mankind survive? These are no longer theory, but are in the marketplace, uh, tied together so that they cannot be separated, matters on which the daily lives of millions upon millions depend. Never were such universal questions asked by the whole of the civilized world. 
Never have such inadequate answers been given. All that the bourgeoisie can answer is the purely technical question of the manufacture of atomic energy, and it wishes that it could not. Now it is precisely because this contradiction of society has reached its farthest point in Stalinist Russia that the dialectical and materialist analysis of Russia is the most important key to the perspective of world civilization. The second law of dialectical materialism is the change of quantity into quality. At a certain stage, a developing contradiction, so to speak, explodes, and both the elements of contradiction are thereby altered. In the history of society, these explosions are known as revolution. All the economic, social, and political tendencies of the age find a point of completion, which becomes the starting point of new tendencies. The Russian Revolution is one such explosion. But the examination of the Russian Revolution involves both the laws of development through contradictions and the change of quantity into quality. Let us examine the Russian Revolution and some of its most important features, such as would be agreed upon by most observers, excepting the diehard reactionaries. The revolution was the greatest outburst of social energy and creativity that we have yet seen. Previously, the French Revolution had astonished mankind by the rapidity and grandeur of its achievements. So much so that to this day, July 14th, 1789 is the date in all probability most widely known among the great majority of mankind. But the Russian Revolution exceeded the French. A combination of workers and peasants, the lowest classes of mankind, tore up an established government by the roots and accomplished the greatest social overturn in history. Starting from nothing, they created a new state, created an army of millions, defended the new regime against famine, blockade, and wars of intervention on all fronts. They reorganized the economy. They made Russia a modern state. They passed and tried honestly to carry out a series of laws on popular education, equality of women, repudiation of religious superstition, sexual sanity, workers' control of production, all of which constituted the greatest potential human democracy and enlightenment that the world had ever seen. They organized a worldwide communist international devoted to the achievement of the same ideals in the entire world. The gradual decline and final failure are treated in the text, but the accomplishments are history, imperishable, and of permanent significance for mankind. Taking it in its entirety, the heroic period of the Russian Revolution is the most glorious episode in human history. Lenin, the leader of the revolution, claimed always that one of the greatest achievements was the establishment of a new type of democracy, the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies, which was able to unloose the creative energies of the great masses of the people. Their mere administration of the state um, in his opinion, would make the further existence of capitalism impossible. This administration by the masses is not yet socialism, but it is no longer capitalism. It is a tremendous step towards socialism, a step from which, if, completely, if complete democracy is retained, no backward step towards capitalism would be possible without the most atrocious violence perpetrated upon the masses. Capital in the form of state capital once more rules in Russia. Democracy has not been retained, but this has been done only at the cost of the condition foreseen by Lenin. The most atrocious violence has been perpetrated upon the masses of the people. Thus, the Russian Revolution, as it had developed and declined, shows us the two most violent extremes that we have known in history. It is only dialectical materialism that can unite these extremes in logical and intelligible connection. It is the creative power, the democratic desires, the expansion of human personality, the record of achieve achievement that was the Russian Revolution. It is these which have called forth the violence, the atrocities, the state organized as murder incorporated. Only such violence could have repressed such democracy. One can see the glint in the eye of the enemy of the proletarian revolution. Without perspective, himself, intellectually helpless before the contemporary barbarism, indulging in nonsensical opposites like yogis and commissars, or researching diligently in his own writing inside for this solution to the problem of the world, he hastens to use the fact of the Russian degeneration as an unanswerable argument against the ideas of Bolshevism. Patience, my friend, patience. 
Bolshevism, says Trotsky, is above all a philosophy of history and a political conception. Without the philosophy, the political conception falls to the ground. We have to get to the philosophy step by step. We have arrived at this much. The atrocious violence and crimes which now distinguish the state of Stalin are the necessary in it and inevitable response to the revolutionary fervor and democratic organization and expression of the Russian people. Not the Russian people in general, however, but the Russian people as they had developed and expressed themselves in the Socialist Revolution of 1917. This is not merely a Russian phenomenon. The Russian Revolution is a climax to a series of revolutions which have moved according to certain laws. Briefly, the British Revolution in the 17th century embraced only small sections of the population. Some revolutionary bourgeois, petty bourgeois farmers, and yeomen, and a small number of artisans, and others in the few and small towns. They could not create the new, but they could destroy the old. The work of the revolution having been accomplished, the counter-revolution, heir to the new social order, established itself by a mere invitation to Charles II to return. A handful of people only were punished. With the development of economy and its socialization, i.e. the increasing interrelation of all classes in production, the French Revolution embraces the great mass of the nation. The revolution destroys feudalism and establishes the modern state. Its basic work accomplished, order must be restored to society by the counter-revolution, the heirs to the new regime, but this time there are millions of aroused people. It is the great body of the nation which is to be disciplined. No mild return of royalty, no forgiveness, no mutual amnesty. Only the military police dictatorship of Napoleon can hold this country down. The contradiction between the revolution and the counter-revolution has sharpened. Society established itself on new foundations, but the contradiction between the classes grows. If the revolution in Russia was the broadest and deepest development of the revolution of the 17th century, the Stalinist regime is the similar development of the counter-revolution. The German Revolution of 1918 did not overthrow bourgeois property, but the German proletariat, infinitely larger and more highly developed than the Russian, had a long history of democratic achievement and organization behind it. After the revolution, its organization continued and expanded. That is why the Nazi counter-revolution was as brutal as it was. But if the German proletariat in 1918 had established a Soviet state embracing workers, agricultural proletarians, and semi-proletarians, the lower ranks of the petty bourgeoisie and the sympathetic intelligent intelligentsia, then logically speaking, one of two things would have happened. Either the new democratic formation would have gone on from strength to strength, awakening the deepest reserves of social power and aspirations of the already highly developed German people and spreading throughout Europe, either this or something else. The, atroci the atrocities and the violence which would have been needed to suppress a successful German proletarian revolution and the response it would have awakened in the German and other European peoples would have exceeded the crimes of Hitler as much as Hitler exceeded the crimes of Napoleon. The pervading barbarism of the Stalinist regime, therefore, is not to be attributed to this or that weakness in the theory of communism, or some partial aspect of the Stalinist state. Stage by stage, we have seen the revolution and the counter-revolution develop in Europe over the centuries. At each new stage of development, both the revolution and the counter-revolution assume a new quality with the new quality of the social development. Precisely because the Russian Revolution assumed a new quality in attempting to establish a universal democracy, the Russian counter-revolution assumes a new quality of universal barbarism in the sense that it embraces all aspects of the Russian state. At this stage, to try to separate progressive aspects from so comprehensive and all-pervading an enemy of human development, as is the Stalinist state, is to strike down the dialectical method at the root. Hegel understood the limits within which one could des designate a corruption as partial. Um, he said in The Philosophy of History, the Reformation resulted from the corruption of the Church. That corruption was not an accidental phenomenon. It is not the mere abuse of power and domination. A corrupt state of things is very frequently represented as an abuse. It is taken for granted that the foundation was good. The system, the institution itself, faultless, 
but that the passion, the subjective interest, in short, the arbitrary volition of men, has made use of that which in itself was good to further its own selfish ends, and that all that is required to be done is to remove these advent adventitious elements. On this showing, the institute in question escapes ob obliquy, and the evil that disfigures it appears something foreign to it. But when accidental abuse of a good thing really occurs, it is limited to particularity. A great and general corruption affecting a body of such large and comprehensive scope as a church is quite another thing. The corruption of the church was a need of growth. The Russian Revolution is the completion of a historical process, the development of class society. Its relation to past revolution can be illuminated by the laws of changes of quantity into quality. The British Revolution, although it pointed the road for the rest of Europe, was only to a subordinate degree of international significance. The French Revolution shook the whole of Europe to its foundations and established the log logical lines along which revolution and counter-revolution would struggle in Europe for the succeeding century. It is in the very nature of modern society and the Russian Revolution that Russia today is symbolical of the whole fate of modern civilization. There is no further stage. Either the revolution succeeds in encompassing the whole of the world, or the whole of the world collapses in counter-revolution and barbarism. The whole path of Western civilization for 2,000 years has reached an ultimate stage in Russia. There is no bypass. There is no third alternative. Therefore, as dialectical materialists, we do not bewail, nor do we underestimate, or in any way attempt to minimize the monstrous character of the Stalinist regime. We repudiate utterly any idea that what is there has any socialist character whatever, but we draw from it for Russia itself and for the whole world an ultimate universal conclusion. The barbarism is not to come, it is there. In our previously quoted pamphlet we have written, the, un un the unending murders, the destruction of peoples, the bestial passions, the sadism, the cruelties, and the lusts, all the manifestations of barbarism of the late 30 year, last 30 years are unparalleled in history, but this barbarism exists only because nothing else can suppress the readiness for sacrifice, the democratic instincts, and creative power of the great masses of the people. Those are the two forces in conflict. The, philo the philosophy of history, which is Bolshevism, bases itself upon the destruction of the barbarism by the inevitable triumph of the socialist revolution. There are even revolutionaries who deny this. For them, it is not scientific to believe in, ine in inevitability. Such a belief implies that dialectic is a religion or mysticism. For them, the correct scientific attitude is to reserve judgment. Yet these very ones turn out to be the mystics and the practitioners of an ill-concealed religiosity. If they recognize the bankruptcy of bourgeois democracy, if they accept the need for universality in the masses, if they recognize that barbarism is the only force that can suppress this need, then to refuse to accept the inevitability of socialism leaves only one of two choices. Either the inevitability of barbarism, that is to say, the acceptance of the principle of inevitabil inevitability which they have just rejected, or the hope, the faith, the belief that history will offer some way out of the impasse. This is the denial of a philosophy of history, that is to say, the denial of a method of thought, for which the only name is rationalism or mysticism. The deniers of the inevitability of socialism can be routed both historically and logically. Marx developed his, his philosophical doctrines in the years which preceded the 1848 revolutions. The revolution was obviously on the way. Yet society was dominated by the experience of the great French Revolution, which had achieved such miracles, but had failed to achieve universality, liberty, equality, and fraternity, and despite all its sacrifices and bloodshed, has ended in the triumph of the counter-revolution. The experience of 1830 had only multiplied both the fears and the hopes which had, which had been engendered by the colossal experience of the French Revolution. 
In this period, so similar to ours, philosophy came out of the study, particularly in Germany, and attempted to give some answers to the problems that were shaking society. The utopian socialists of all stripes were distinguished precisely by this, that they argued interminably about the possibility as opposed to the inevitability of the socialist revolution. They were tortured by those doubts because, after the experience of the French Revolution and its obvious failure to relieve the conditions of the great masses of the people, they themselves had lost faith in the inevitability of socialism, which is only another way of saying the inevitability of the achievement by the people of complete self-expression, complete democracy, socialism. Insofar as their beliefs were the result of theoretical speculation, they had, in the words of Marx, lost the capacity to draw from the experience of man's past in order to establish perspective for man's future. The result was a complete chaos, disorder, confusion in their own thoughts, with an absolute inability to meet the challenge of the approaching revolution. It was into this ulcer that Marx drove the knife of scientific socialism. Bolshevism is a philosophy of history. Marx first clarified himself philosophically as he wrote to Rouge in 1843. <clears throat> Almost greater than the outer ob obstacles appear in the inner difficulties. For although there is no doubt about the whence, there prevails the more confusion about the whither. Not only has the general anarchy broken out among the reformers, each of them also must himself confess that he has no exact conception of what ought to be. Precisely in this is the advantage of the new movement, that we do not anticipate the new world dogmatically, but intend to find the new in the criticism of the old world. Up to now, the philosophers have had the solution of all riddles lying in their desks, and the dumb exoteric world had only to gape in order for the ready-baked pies of wisdom to fly into their mouths. Philosophy has become worldly, and the most decisive proof of this is that philosophic con consciousness has been drawn into the anguish of the struggle, not only superficially, but thoroughly. If the construction of the future and the preparation for all time is not our affair, it is all the more certain what we have to complete at present, i.e. the most relentless criticism of all existing things, relentless both in the sense that the criticism fears no results and even less fears conflicts with the existing powers. We face the same situation today in the radical and revolutionary movement. In 1947, however, not only is philosophy worldly, in the face of the universal character of the crisis, the world is driven to become philosophical. It is compelled to examine in their nature and in the totality of their relations, that is to say, philosophically, economics, politics, science, and even the very nature of the universe and society. All agitation about the possibility of barbarism, third alternatives, the mysticism of the inevitability of socialism, these are no more than what they were in Marx's day only infinitely more so. Terror before the destruction of contradictions of modern society, doubts of the capacity of the proletariat to resolve them. This amounts to no more than a defense of bourgeois society insofar as bourgeois society still can provide thinkers with freedom enough to substitute the analysis of their own thoughts for a positive intervention in the chaos of society. So far, historically, Logically, the inevitability of socialism is the absolute reverse of religion or mysticism. It is a consciously constructed necessity of thought. As we have quoted in the article on historical retrogression, Hegel recognized that without holding fast in thought to your ultimate goal, it is impossible to think properly. <clears throat> to hold fast the positive in its negative, and the content of the presupposition in the result, is the most important part of rational cognition. Also, only the simplest reflection is needed to furnish conviction of the absolute truth and necessity of this requirement. While with regard to the examples of proofs, the whole of logic consists of these. Precisely because they held fast to the presupposition of the inevitability of bourgeois society, the bourgeois thinkers in the early days of capitalism made their tremendous contributions to the science of human thought. Even without philosophical perspective, the bourgeoisie at least had one reality, maintenance of power against the workers and rival bourgeoisies. 
but without presupposing the inevitability of socialism, that is to say, without thinking always in terms of the victory of the masses, thinking among those hostile to bourgeois society must become a form of scholasticism and Gnosticism, self-agitation and caprice. Over a hundred years ago, Hegel said that the simplest reflection will show the necessity of holding fast the positive in the negative. The presupposition in the result, the affirmation that is contained in every negation, the future that is in the present. It is one of the signs of the advanced stage of human development that this is not long, no longer a mere philosophical but a concrete question. <laughs> to anyone that does not accept bourgeois society, the simplest reflection shows that it is impossible not only to think, but to take any kind of sustained positive action in the world today unless one postulates the complete victory of the great masses of the people. What is this but the exemplification in life of the logical theory, the inevitability of socialism? The Stalinist state, the Nazi state, and in their varying degrees all states today, based upon property and privilege, are the negation of the complete democracy of the people. It is this state which is to be destroyed, that is to say, it is this state which is to be negated by the proletarian revolution. Thus, the inevitability of socialism is the inevitability of the negation of the negation, the third and most important law of the dialectic. I have said earlier that the laws of the dialectic are hypotheses. Any pragmatist who is rubbing his hands with joy at this reasonable Marxism is in for rude disillusionment. Dialectics, said Lenin, is the theory of knowledge of Hegel and Marxism. So far, I have been dealing with it as a theory of knowledge, as a mode of thought, examining more or less empirically contemporary society and the Russian Revolution, and showing how by means of the dialectical approach, some order, some perspective, some understanding come out of them, showing equally why the bourgeoisie can make no sense of anything except to hold on to power. But Marx's hypotheses were not hypotheses in general. They were not empirically arrived at, tentatively used, discarded if not satisfactory, experimental or instrumentalist. They were logical abstractions organized according to the method of Hegel and reflecting the movement of human society. This is no simple matter, but it has remained obscured and neglected too long. The dialectic is a theory of knowledge, but, per but precisely for that reason, it is a theory of the nature of man. Hegel and Marxism did not first arrive at a theory of knowledge which they applied to nature and society. They arrived at a theory of knowledge from their examination of men in society. The first question was, what is man? What is the truth about him? Where has he come from and where is he going? They answered that question first because they knew that without any answer to that general question, they could not think about particular questions. Both Hegel and Marx, in their different ways, believed that man is destined for freedom and happiness. They did not wish this. Or they did, that does not matter. They came to this conclusion by examining man's history as a totality. Man for Marx was not Christian man, nor the man of the French Revolution, nor Stalin's bloodstained secret police. The concept of man was a constantly developing idea, which was headed for some sort of completeness. When Marx said that, with the achievement of the socialist revolution, the real history of humanity will begin, he was not being rhetorical or inspiring or optimistic. He was being strictly and soberly scientific. The truth is the whole. The whole, however, is merely the essential nature reaching its completeness through the process of its own development. Of the absolute, it must be said that it is essentially a result that only at the end is it what it is in very truth. Thus Hegel in the phenomenology of mind, Marx worked on the sample principles. The essential nature of man was becoming clear only as it approached its complete, completeness in bourgeois society. It is in bourgeois society that we could see that what man really is. And it is only at the end of bourgeois society that we can see what man is in very truth. Thus it is in the contemporary barbarism that can be seen most clearly what is the real nature of humanity. The need and desire for socialism, for complete democracy, for complete freedom, that is the real nature of man. 
It is this which explains his past, but it could be expressed within the con concrete circumstances of past ages only to the degree that objective circumstances allow. Did man therefore suffer through all those centuries to produce completed man? The defenders of bourgeois society are ready to defend and rage over all these unjustified sufferings of past mankind in their die-hard opposition to the proletarian revolution, which will relieve present mankind. They will get nothing to comfort themselves with. The truth is the whole. All the various stages constitute the nature of man, continues Hegel. And just in that consists its nature, which is to be actual, subject, or self-becoming, self-development. Man is the subject, that which is developing itself. The subject becomes more and more real, and therefore the truth about man becomes deeper and wider, more universal, more complex, more concrete. Complete universality, complete democracy in the sense that every man is able to do what every other man does. This is the ultimate stage. The Russian Revolution was an imperfect, limited, handicapped, but nevertheless decisive step in this direction. The nature of man, therefore, becomes the search for this completeness and the overcoming of the obstacles which stood and stand in its way. Past history, therefore, becomes intelligible, and what is more important, the road to the solution of the overwhelming problems to the present day becomes open. If today we see that now we know what is the real man, it is because we see him as a totality, as the result of his whole past. But from there we make another step. The terrible crisis of civilization is the result of the fact that man is at last real. He has become himself completely developed. But the old type of world which developed him cannot contain him. He must burst th through it. That world was a world in which he was subjected to nature. It was in the subjection of nature that he fully realized himself, a continuous negation of the obstacles which impeded his development. That being accomplished, the real history will begin. He negates all that has previously impeded him, i.e. negated him, in the full realization of his inherent nature. Socialism is the negation of all previous negations. It is obvious that these are large conceptions, but the death of a world civilization is not a small thing. The conception being stated, it is now necessary not to prove it. Only life can do that, but to show where it came from. Western civilization, and therefore the Hegelian dialectic, begins with Christianity. It was Christianity which established universality in its most abstract form, that very universality which we are now seeing concretely striving for expression in the proletariat all over the contemporary world. The very early or primitive Christians attempted a universality that was extremely concrete, commonality of goods, and absolute equality. But it soon collapsed. The abstract universality was established by that historical Christianity which superseded the Roman Empire. Christianity united all men before birth in the universality of original sin and after death in the possibility of universal redemption in heaven. Thus it carefully avoided a concrete universality. It was the religion of the millions who had been released from slavery by the collapse of the Roman Empire. The narrow, straightened circumstances of their material lives were compensated for by the subjective conception of an afterlife in which all their material needs would be satisfied, or, better still, there would be no need for material satisfactions at all. But extreme abstraction, though it was, man is for the first time established as universal man. <clears throat> Hegel expresses the idea in all its fullness in the philosophy of history. Man, finite when regarded for himself, is yet at the same time the image of God and a fountain of infinity in himself. He is the object of his own existence, has in himself an infinite value, an external destiny. Consequently, he has his true home in a supersensuous world, an infinite subjectivity gained only by a rupture with mere natural existence and violation, and by his labor to break their power from within. These conditions are not yet 
a, con a concrete order, but simply the first abstract principles, which are won by the instrumentality of the Christian religion for the secular state. First, under Christianity, slavery is impossible. For man as man, in the abstract essence of his nature, is contemplated in God. Each unit of mankind is an object of the grace of God and of the divine purpose. God will have all men to be saved. <clears throat> Utterly excluding all special speciality, therefore man in and for himself, in his simple quality of man, has infinite value, and this infinite value abolishes ipso facto all, all particular all all particularity attaching to birth or country. <clears throat> this is what Hegel calls an abstract universal. The history of humanity is no more than this abstract universal becoming concrete. International socialism is the concrete em embodiment of the abstract principle of Christianity. In Christianity appeared an international socialism is now appearing because they are of the very nature of man. To call the recognition of this teleology and religion is a sign of the greatest ignorance, or is not ignorance, but a determination at all costs to defend bourgeois society against the philosophy of Bolshevism today, so as not to have to defend it against the revolutionary masses tomorrow. To have been Christian and to be socialist is an expression of the need for concrete universality, which is not so much in as, in as of the very nature of man. And dialectical and dialectic bases itself upon this precisely because it is not religious and not teleological. If this, scientifically speaking, is not the nature of man, then what do the opponents of dialectic offer instead? Either man has expressed these desires and these aims by accident, i.e. they have no significance whatever, for he might have expressed entirely different aims and had entirely different needs, and may do so tomorrow, or these needs and aims are not the nature of man, but came from some outside agency or God. It is only in the sense described above that dialectical speaking of freedom and happiness being the purpose of man's existence. Purpose not in the religious sense, but in the sense that if we examine man's history through the centuries, he has sought these aims. It is difficult, therefore, to say what other purpose his existence has. And the anti-dialectician is left with the alternative that man's life has no purpose at all, which is only another way of accommodating one's self to the existing society, bourgeois society. The logical principle of universality contains within it a logical contradiction, the contradiction of abstract and concrete. The logical contradiction is a direct reflection of the objective circumstances in which the men of early Christianity lived. Their physical and material circumstances were on the lowest possible level, and therefore to make their existence a totality, they had to fill it out with this tremendous abstraction. Thus is established the basic logical contradiction in the universal between concrete and abstract, between objective and subjective, between real and ideal, between content and form, but, put, but both together form a whole and have no meaning apart from each other. They are opposites, but interpenetrated. To Christian man, the, concept, the conception of heaven was real and necessary, an integral part of his existence in the objective world. Those who accuse dialectics of being a religion understand neither dialectics nor religion. The history of man is his effort to make the abstract universal concrete. He constantly seeks to destroy, to move aside, that is to say, to negate what impedes his movement towards freedom and happiness. Man is the subject of history. The subject, man, is pure and simple neg negativity. <coughs> This is a cardinal principle of the dialectical movement. The process is molecular, day by day, day by day, never resting, continuous. But at a certain stage, the continuity is interrupted. The molecular changes achieve a universality and explode into a new quality, a revolutionary change. Previous to the revolutionary explosion, the aims of the struggle can be posed in partial terms, possibility. It is the impossibility of continuing to do this that interrupts the continuity. The revolution, precisely because it is a revolution, demands all things for all men. 
It is an attempt to leap from the realm of objective necessity to the realm of objective freedom. But in the limited objective circumstances to which the low level of product productivity has confined society, what is demanded by, of, and for all men, only some men can, ha can have. The concrete universality, therefore, becomes the property of some men, a class. They are therefore compelled to use objective violence against those excluded, and to substitute an abstract universality for the concrete universality of which the mass has been deprived. But the absence of concrete universality from the whole also limits the universal universality of the few. Their own concrete universality therefore begins to be limited, and its limitations substituted for by abstractions. This is the Hegelian process of mediation, the new state established after the revolution, the ideology which accompanies it, are a form of mediation between abstract and concrete, ideal and real, etc. The mediation usually assumes the form of the state power, and the specific ideological combinations of abstract and concrete to bind the new relations are developed by the philosophy of the age. A new equilibrium in the process of the development of man has been established. At a later stage, the same developing process will be repeated in the attempt to negate the actual stage of man's previously established previous the actual stage of man previously established. There will be the mass revolution for undifferentiated universality, the class differentiation in its realization, the splitting of the nation into opposing factors, and the attempt to realize in ideology the reconciliation of the opposing factors. Man is not only what he does, but what he thinks and what he aims at. But this can only be judged by the concrete, what actually takes place. The truth is always concrete, but it is the concrete viewed in the light of the whole. In the decisive page of the preface to the phenomenology, Hegel writes, As subject, it is pure and simple negativity, and just on that account a process of splitting up what is simple and undifferentiated, a process of duplicating and setting factors in opposition, which process in turn is the negation of this indifferent diversity and of the opposition of factors it entails. It is the process of its own becoming, the circle which presupposes its end as its purpose and has its end for its beginning. It becomes concrete and actual only by being carried out, and by the end it involves. Marx is expressing concretely just this concentrated Hegelian generalization when he says, for each new class which puts itself in the place of one ruling before it is compelled, merely in order to carry through its aim, to represent its interest as the common interest of all the members of society, put in an ideal form, it will give its ideas the form of universality, and represent them as the only rational, universally valid ones. The class makes a revolution appear from the very start, merely because it is opposed to a class, not as a class, but as the representative of the whole society. It appears as the whole mass of society confronting the one ruling class. It can do this because, to start with, its interest really is more connected with the common interest of all other non-ruling classes, because under the pressure of conditions, its interest has not yet been able to develop as the particular interest of a particular class. Its victory, therefore, benefits also many individuals of other classes, which are not winning a dominant position, but only insofar as it now puts these individuals in a position to raise themselves into the ruling class. Every new class, therefore, achieves its hegemony only on a broader basis than that of the class ruling previously, in return for which the opposition of the non-ruling class against the new ruling class later develops all the more sharply and profoundly. Both these things determine the fact that the struggle to be waged against this new ruling class in its turn aims at a more decided and radical negation of the previous conditions of society than could all previous classes which sought to rule. This organization of historical development did not fall from the sky. It is the result of the concept of the dialectic worked out by Hegel, and without the dialectic, it could not be done at all. It is this, he it is this Hegel that Burnham calls the arch muddler of human thought. 
It is from the examination of this process, the, the developing conflicts between abstract and concrete, subjective and objective, the abstract universal assuming a certain content which becomes concentrated in a special form. The form gradually becomes infused with a new content until it can contain it no longer and explodes. It is from the examination of all this in society and nature, but particularly in its ideological reflection in philosophy, that Hegel works out the significance of categories and the movement of his logic. Just as Marx's economic categories were in reality social categories, just in the same way the logical categories, contradictions, etc. of Hegel were a reflection of social categories and social movement, Hegel, and for very good reasons of his time, led his logic into an impossible and fantastic idealism about world spirit, etc. But the basis of his work was solidly materialistic. He himself explained he himself explains that the community of principle, which really links together individuals of the same class and in virtue of which they are similarly related <clears throat> to other existences, assumes a form in human consciousness, and that form is the thought or idea which summa summarily comprehends the constituents of generic character. Every universal in thought has a corresponding generic principle in reality to which it gives intellectual expression or form. Marx and Engels knew this. They could carry over the Hegelian dialectic into a materialistic form because it had been derived originally not from religion but from a study of the stages of man in nature and society and the reflection of these stages in human thought. The dialectic of negativity, the negation of the negation, the inevitability of socialism, are a culmination in logical thought of social processes that have now culminated in contemporary society. You look in vain in writings of Hooke, professor of philosophy at New York University in Burnham, a member of the same faculty, for the slightest understanding of this. The beginning of this process for the modern world is Christianity, and the beginning presupposes its end as its purpose. For Hegel, these stages are the work of the universal spirit. Marx here is his diametrical opposite. Marx is a dialectical materialist. For him, and right from the very start, these concrete revolutionary stages are the work of the great masses of the people, forever seeking the concretion of universality as the development of the productive forces creates the objective circumstances and the subjective desires which move them. <clears throat> Hegel could see the abstract universal, the relation between abstract and concrete in historical Christianity and the developing relation in human history. Marx saw that, but because he was closer to the end, he could see more of the real man. Because he had seen the revolutionary proletariat, he was able to complete the dialectical analysis of previous stages by the recognition of the role of the revolutionary masses. These appear at the very beginning of history. In his introduction to class struggles in France, Engels writes, this party of revolt of those known by the names of Christian was also strongly represented in the army. Whole legions were Christian. When they were ordered to attend the sacrificial ceremonies of the pagan established church, in order to do the honors there, the rebel soldiers had the audacity to stick peculiar emblems across on their helmets in protest. Even the wanted barrack cruelties of their superior officers were fruitless. The Emperor Diocletian could no longer quietly look on while order, obedience, and discipline in his army were being undermined. He intervened energetically while there was still time. He passed an anti-socialist, I should say anti-Christian law. The meetings of the rebels were forbidden. Their meeting halls were closed or even pulled down. The Christian badges, crosses, etc. were like the red handkerchiefs in Saxony, prohibited. Christians were declared incapable of holding offices in the state. They were not to be allowed even to become corporals. Since they were not available at, the at that time, judges so well trained in respect of persons as Herr von Koller's anti-revolt bill assumes, the Christians were forbidden out of hand to seek justice before court. This exceptional law was also without effect. 
The Christians tore it down from the walls with scorn. They are even supposed to have burnt the emperor's palace in Nicomedia over his head. Then the latter revenged himself by the great persecution of Christians in the year 303, according to our chronology. It was the last of its kind, and it was so effective that 17 years later, the army